we do. But so these are my research notes um, on, let's say, an undisciplined approach to learning or to education. And I think it starts with crushing parties. Um, so what do I mean? I think you mentioned before, uh, Torsten, there's the inside, there's the outside, there's the academic world, there's the artistic world. So there's so many hermetic environments. There's so many bubbles we're in. You know, even just in science of education, you're in your bubble. I'm in my bubble. And I think it's really important to crush parties. Go uninvited. Go to places that you're not invited to and be curious about stuff that you're actually not interested in. And that's how I think we can start to, you know, a question also like it, to, let's say, generate a systemic change. We, we are so bound to our worlds. We're still here in this context trying to define something again. What is it? Is this, it? who cares, no? Like, um, I think it's really important, like literally be the party crusher. Um, second one is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm joking a little bit and I'm not joking. It's a provocative approach. Ignorance is bliss. Why do I believe that in our context, we're all in a, one way or another involved in education? We have responsibility, we learned that. Why is ignorance bliss? Because um, I think sometimes it's very good not to know. I think, Susanna, you mentioned that there's very big problems, there's never a simple answer. And people that say, ah, oh, it's simple, I have an answer, they're in most cases wrong. So to be what Jacques Rancier called the ignorant school schoolmaster, not sure if you're familiar, it's a book called Five Lessons in Emancipatory Education, is that if, as a responsible educator, you have to teach the students that you can't teach them anything. You have to kind of help them in their intellectual emancipation, but it is very helpful to not actually know. Like, thinking that you know can be very harmful in the process of finding a solution to things. It is funny, the book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster by um, uh, uh, Rancier, he actually kind of refers to an um, early um, an inspiratory teacher in the like, late, 18th century, who was teaching as a Frenchman in, uh, in Belgium, in Flemish, in a, in a language he couldn't speak, and he was teaching all kinds of classes, piano, arts, that he had no idea about. So sometimes it's good to enter in a field that you don't know anything about. Crush the party, ignorance is bliss. Undiscovered public knowledge, that's um, also interesting, and um, I think you also mentioned in a way that before, um, uh, Susanna, again, when you talked about how you use also AI in, your, uh, in the research process, is there's a lot of public knowledge that is undiscovered. There's a very interesting article by Don Swanson, it's a library scientist from the 80s, it's called Undiscovered Public Knowledge, where he says um, that uh, it's like we can find and we can find new knowledges by looking in different fields. So maybe there's medical papers, scientific papers in medical studies that are super relevant for practices in the arts or in engineering. And we again stay in our bubbles. So uh, the fact that uh, knowledge is public does not mean uh, it's discovered, we're using it. And this is very uh, important to, to kind of understand and kind of see how we can interact with this. And this brings us also to the idea that intelligence is, again, inherently ecosystemic. Um, I believe that uh, any intelligent discourse does not happen in a vacuum. Like, we, um, we are, I can speak here with Lynn Margulis, for example, we live in symbiosis. You know, symbiosis is the kind of biggest and most dramatic event in the history of life, to like very the very unlikely encounter of two organisms. And that's also go happening in, in intelligence. Intelligence comes from interlegere, so the reading in between. So basically intelligence means to read between the lines. And that's something that we have to kind of remind us and in, in our context is very important. And also intelligence is, and this is a very cheesy but wonderful quote, supposedly by Einstein, intelligence is create, no, um, yeah, uh, intelligence is creativity having fun. Or the other way around, creativity is intelligence having fun. This is something good to remember, but most importantly, any intelligent kind of endeavor is not a monofunctional thing. It happens in an ecosystem. It's ecosystemic. And learning is accumulative. So we learn by kind of building on prior knowledge and connecting to prior experiences. 
I, this is kind of banal almost, but I really learned this in a colloquium that I've been running for the last two years at the UDK. It's called Post Protocol. So kind of a beyond standard protocol. And it's a group of 25 master students who are in their final year. So they're doing, they're kind of in the, in the process of preparing their master thesis or their kind of final graduation. They come from architecture, from cultural studies, from Gesellschaft und Wirtschaftskommunikation, from fashion, fine arts, product design, everything that we have there. And they present in this group. And there's 25 people, and our rule is like we do a round, and everyone gives a feedback. Even if you don't have anything to say, you give a feedback. Because um, the main rule is like state the obvious. Whatever is obvious to me, with my philosophy background in a teaching, is maybe not obvious to you. And what is obvious to you, with your background, is not obvious to me. So don't try to be intelligent, don't try to be creative, but state the fucking obvious. This enriches the discussion. And then we learned. And we kind of learned this together over the two years, that by 20 people, one after another, given their feedback, the knowledge grows in the room. By everyone listening to the other, kind of also playing on what the other person said, kind of incorporating in their feedback, towards the end of this round, we have created a completely new knowledge, also for the participants, that was not in the room before. So it's accumulative. And then almost banal, this goes, and all of this actually, I think, counts for both the arts and the sciences, what I'm saying here. Iteration is necessary. Let's say from a scientific uh, idea, you, you need experiments. I mean, science is built on experience, on trials and trials and trials. The famous quote on trials is, um, try again, fail again, fail better, is actually Samuel Beckett, statistic background. But it's the same idea. You have to try again, you have to fail again, and Failure wastage is, uh, without that, there is no creativity. Creativity happens only in iteration. There was a really interesting study um, from the University of Stanford, more in a kind of product design background, how many iterations it takes to create a successful product. Rough number, what do you guess? Throw some numbers in. 150? Give me two more. 600. Okay, let's say 100. It's 2,000. It's 2,000. And this is a crazy reminder. Like, it's to kind of, and it, then we don't even know if it's sustainable, etc. But generally speaking, it's not, oh, I try one, two, three, four times. No, it's like much more. We need this iteration. Without this, we cannot be successful. I have five minutes left. That's great. So it's actually, I wanted to have like my 10 commandments, and then yesterday night, I realized it's only nine. So it's actually good. But, um, yeah, and then uh, education is never neutral, and this I mean in a twofold way. That's on the one hand, uh, in Paul Freire's way of like critical pedag pedagogy, like um, ped education is always also a political act. Like you can never not be political in the sense of not that you have to kind of belong to a certain party, but you are, are in a political context. You're in the polis. You're in the city. You are kind of you have a responsibility. We talked about this. We are part of society. And I think it's important to be aware of that. And this is kind of what resonated with also the introduction by the vice president. But on the other hand, what I also mean with education is never neutral, because education is always personal and interrelational. And that's something that's often forgotten. And I totally disagree with colleagues who say, oh, the students today, they don't work anymore, etc." Well, then I think then look in the mirror. Something you are doing is you're doing wrong, because education is primarily, and this is actually going back to Pestalozzi or to John Dewey, it's interpersonal. It's, it's about building a relationship to the ones in the room. And I think this is a, something that you have to either have or you have to kind of build, but you have to have this kind of, uh, kind of responsible thought as an educator that this is on you, actually. You have to build this up. And if you don't have that skill, develop it. But um, this is how... I mean, Pestalozzi says it's Vorbild und Liebe. It's again, very cheesy, but so true. And this goes whether it's your kid or it's your student. Like, be a role model, like lived action rather than words, and pay attention, you know? Like, be passionate about what you're doing. And then we come to violate, violate established rules. Kind of goes with the crush party. Um, and the idea here is that um, almost all great discoveries whether it's in science or in the artistic field, have been done by people who did not follow the rules, who kind of thought differently, 
who kind of violated established norms and regulations. And um, again, maybe you're also familiar, Paul Feierabend wrote this famous book called Against Method, and he had this term of epistemological anarchism. So kind of, yes, science has a lot of methods, and they believe this method is the right one. Yeah, but not really. You know, there's many, many different methods, and one kind of can pick from them and kind of don't kind of just restrict to one third methodology, but there's many in the room. And it's good to kind of violate these things because that's where usually kind of discoveries really, really happen. And then maybe the last one is um, Wissenskunst and Wissenschaft. Wissenschaft is the German word for science and Wissenskunst is a kind of a new term um, that is uh, both, and I think you just mentioned in the beginning while introducing me, Thorsten, we have in the science kind of this feeling that we know like we are knowledge generators, but then again, there's a whole different form of knowledge, this Wissen der Künste, the knowledge of the arts or the Wissenskunst, that is equally important. And um, there are two different epistemological approaches, but they have the same importance. We can learn from them, or the community learning that you mentioned. What do we learn from the tree, et cetera? Et cetera. So I think it's important, and in, in particular in this kind of really fucking complex reality that we're living in. I mean, this is really a handful. You gotta be kind of be almost a poet to to kind of understand what's going on. So that said, I have probably one minute left, Dawson. Come to the end. Good timing, and I think uh, wrapping this up as being the artistic intervention. I'm really not. You were again much more artistic than I was. But in arts and science, I think um, I do not see them as two different fields, two different cultures. But actually, they're more united than anything else because. A, they both uh, are deeply engaged with the exploration of the unknown, the scientists that ask the questions, or the artists, and they both uh, deal in the business of imagination. Like you have to imagine something first. And imagination, I really believe, is our greatest natural resource. Like everything starts with the fiction of what it could be. And this goes both for the arts and the science. That's it. Thank you very much for this little interruption, and I wish a wonderful day. Thank you.